Hi, Regina. I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> All right. Hi, Jamie. Thank you for the blue hearts. You guys know how much I love those blue hearts. All right. I feel like my camera looks way high up. Let's bring it down some. Is that better? Doesn't look like it changed much. That's okay. <laughs> we'll just work with what we got. So you can see all the sign back there anyway. <laughs> all right. So this is my earlier edition of my once a month live. Only because I looked at the calendar with the holidays coming up. Um, my usual fourth Friday of the month is going to fall, you know, back to back on the holidays. So I said, okay, let me just run it a week ahead of time. So... That way I can catch all of you <laughs> and then, you know, whatever for the holidays. So uh, I will not be, of course, having shows for Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. So I will don't be expecting a show on those days um, because you all should be doing whatever. <laughs> uh, but rest assured that I will have um, episodes on all the other dates. So uh, I do have a couple of topics to talk about tonight. Um, I did have some really good questions that came in uh, at the last minute, uh, last couple days. So I was like, oh, you know, I'll just go ahead and talk about a couple of these questions. But tonight's theme is supposed to be, do medical coders make the best patients? Or do they make really good patients? Because when you think about it, right, we know, we're supposed to know what we're looking at when we see our own medical record. And thanks to the electronic medical record, we have access to our medical record at any time. So what do we do when we see things that don't quite make sense to us? How do we, you know, prepare ourselves for that? So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Hi, Christina. Hi, Alicia. Thank you for joining me. All right. So let's go ahead and get into it. If you are brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue. I'm a medical coder. All right. It is Friday Night Live and... Whatever question you have, you can leave them in the description box below. Not description box. In the chat box. I'm thinking <laughs> description box. But in the chat box, you can leave your questions. If they're really general questions, I'll probably tell you to check out my videos. Like, how do I get started in medical coding? That's a big one. Um, and I'll tell you to check out the videos. But if it's something that's related to the conversation tonight, be sure to put it in there. All right, Samantha says, Hello. hi, Blue, love your channel. It's been so helpful to me. Oh, that's good. I'm so glad. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Do medical coders make the best patients? Now, we all know what they say about doctors <laughs> being terrible patients because, of course, they know what they're looking at the whole way. They know what tests to order. They know, you know what, uh, what they're looking at when they're looking at MRIs and X-rays and CT scans. They know all of that, right? Um, but for what about for us medical coders? So somebody brought up in uh, the comments that they had a condition and the diagnosis that they noticed that was selected was another diagnosis. It was alternative, but it was still still saying the same thing, but to a lesser degree. And she's like, well, how does that fit? And will it make my condition seem not as serious, right? So I told her that, you know, the medical coder is going to pick up what is there because as we all know, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. We only select what is in the, just in the note itself. But sometimes when providers are selecting the codes and it really all depends on that facility because some facilities will depend on the provider to work with the electronic medical record and they, they will have like billers to be able to do all the billing stuff. But when it comes down to the coding side, they really want the providers to handle that, which I think is ridiculous because that's not their job. 
That's why we have jobs. <laughs> this is why we need to be good because this is why we show our value and our worth when we know what we're doing because we have to know what doctors know while never having gone to medical school. This is a very tall order, but it is not impossible. I will say that. So that's something for you all to keep in mind. It's not impossible to learn this stuff. It does take time. I am over a decade in and trust me, I'm still learning. <laughs> and and I, sometimes I tell myself it would have just been easier to go to medical school at this point <laughs> for everything that I have to know. But uh, in the meantime, when you are looking at your, your own um, you know, health, health record and you can access it online if you have you know, that, and then if you're looking at it and it doesn't look right, like the diagnosis that was selected is not what's documented, of course, you can call the doctor's office and ask them to review your record again for because we're all patients, right? Um, in my own situation, whenever I meet with the doctor and they ask me, well, what do you do? I tell them I'm a, I am a medical coder. I always tell them that right away because they'll know, <laughs> okay, this, this person's going to know what's in their medical record. And that's the first thing I hear. So you know what's in your medical record, don't you? Yes, I do. And I understand every bit of it, too, because when you think about it, this is what I code all day long, right? Outpatient office visits, right? So I know what a level should look like. I know, you know, if they're supposed to be like, if it's a general well woman visit, I know exactly what codes are going to be selected. And so I do a review every time of my own record. I have a great place um, that I go uh, for all of my care. And so they do a very good job. I mean, my own doctor before, my primary care doctor, my very first primary care doctor that I really loved, <laughs> uh, she was really good on her own at coding. And so I saw that. And so whenever we would talk, you know, I would always, you know, just tell her things that I know or what I've learned or whatever. And so it was always nice to kind of get that feedback too of like, what was she thinking when she does this? And so those are, it's nice to be able to build those relationships with your own provider. But yes, when you see something that doesn't seem right in your medical record, you have every right to question it. And I encourage you to do so because it's important to keep your medical records straight. And if there's not a lot of detail in the documentation, then that's when you should really make sure that you are talking about what is going on with you. For me, uh, I was diagnosed with adult onset asthma, right? And when I was first diagnosed with it, of course, it was shortness of breath and we didn't know. And then when I went through all the, the pulmonary tests, that's when they confirmed it. And so I was able to watch <laughs> my condition go from, um, what is it? Inter, uh, intermittent, uh, moderate, severe, moderate to severe asthma, and then severe asthma, and then back down to moderate asthma, and then just normal asthma. So I was able to watch it because the whole time my provider herself was making sure that she documented appropriately so that the appropriate code could be selected. We have the ability to be really good patients uh, because we know, write down your symptoms, write down your medications and things. It's very important to do this. They talk about this at the doctor's office, but there's not really a huge emphasis on all of us being good patients because how many of us have, have had family members or even ourselves say, you know, I'm on this medication, but I don't know what it's for, you know? So we really do need to be in that driver's seat and we absolutely can. And you can absolutely help your own family members um, if they are like, well, you know, I'm going to the doctor today. Okay, well, do you have your list of medications? Do you have, you know, your symptoms written down? Do you, you know, have you been taking your, if you're a diabetic, are you taking your blood sugars regularly? If you're, if you have hypertension, are you taking your blood pressure regularly? Are you writing this stuff down? Are you getting, you know, getting a log so that the doctor can see it? The more information that the doctor has for you, the better off it is for your medical record, number one, because they have more data to work with and the better quality care that you have because you never know that one thing that you write down about yourself could be the difference between a doctor running a test and not running a test. You know, there may be some, you know, clinical indicator that um, can be used for like whatever test that needs to be ordered because maybe that was an important test for you to get, you know? So we have that, we have that ability. So don't miss out on your own healthcare. 
you know, you have to be really proactive. It's important to be proactive with your health. Uh, if the doctor is telling you, <laughs> hey, you need to work out, hey, you need to do this or you need to do that, that's what you need to do because they are there and it's hard for them too because I'm sure when they see patients that, you know, could live healthier lives that have really bad habits that the patient doesn't want to break, they're just like, Get just doc, just give me the medication. And it's not a good way, right? Because you can do so much when you practice good health habits and you take care of your body, you take care of your, your mind, and it's just better overall for you, right? And not to mention those around you because we are not an island. <laughs> Everybody is connected to somebody else. There, trust me, there's somebody out there who loves you, who cares for you, um, who is your friend, who depends on you. And sometimes you don't even know, right? So that's why you have to take good care of yourself. To me, I have I have good friends. And of course, I have my Uncle Kyle that I love, <laughs> uh, who has been there for me for the last few years since my mother passed away. And so it's nice to have that connection. So I will want to be healthy uh, for a long time so that I could be around for my Uncle Kyle for a long time. And it's the same thing with him. You know, anytime I talk to him, you know, I tell him, you know, how much I'm thankful that he's around and how much I care. <laughs> and that's important. It's important to let people know that. And it's important to let people know that you care. And you show them that you care by taking care of yourself so that you can be there for them. I'm just saying. All right. So what do we have here? Uh, hi, Pamela. <laughs> Hi, Alexandria. Hi, Court. Hi, Ella. <laughs> so, Court says, former coder, RHIT, 1998, coded EROP for 15 years, retired in 2014, now returning to and starting CCS to update. Any special book advice beyond what you've already recommended? No. All the books that I recommended are what I recommend. I don't recommend anything else. <laughs> Um, Ella says, started college, yay, and getting my associates in healthcare information technology. That's awesome. Um, should we get both Optum and Ahima? No. You only need one or the other, and I recommend Optum. Um, Alexandria says, I use my kids as motivation to stay healthy. Yes. <laughs> That's a very good thing. Hi, Medina. Thank you for joining me. So, yes. Um, encourage your family members to write down like any medications that they have and not just the medication, but write down the dosage, right? Because um, you never know if that doctor's going to be going to need that information. And um, also if they're having to go in for any symptoms, like if they're not feeling well, how long has it been going on? Think about what we need to see when we're looking at documentation. And that's how you can prompt yourself or your family members to write down things. All right. Um, if you fall and you, you break a wrist or something, what were you doing when you fell? So that way that external cause code can be in your medical record. <laughs> uh, so that way they have that detail because sometimes people will say, well, external causes are not important for documentation purposes. Incorrect. Even though for some states, there is no requirement uh, for uh, external causes, it, it still needs to be there. And it's still in the interest of data, right? That we have these. I always talk about my example <laughs> for the state of Colorado when there was a lot of, they couldn't figure out why there was a lot of spiral fractures um, happening in the state of Colorado. But when you think about Colorado, right? You think about skiing and there's a lot of downhill skiing that happens. So when you have high velocity accidents, it causes the bone to spin around. And so uh, that's why they had to do a whole campaign on safety and they had to do all kinds of training. And there's all kinds of new developments for fracture care that came out of the state of uh, Colorado because of those things. So that's why it's always important because while it's not always required, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't push for that information to be there in the record. I'm just saying. Wings says, I find that when I take my kids to the doctor, I ask more questions about diagnosis and tests being ordered. <laughs> uh, yes, Medina, paint the whole picture. Absolutely. And get detailed because detail never hurt anybody. Okay, so the more detail we have, the better off. 
you know, the, all the information that the provider can work with. Because how many times have you seen a provider say, well, you know, they're trying to get all of the information from the patient on how the condition happened or what else is going on? Because sometimes the patients just don't know. And if the patient doesn't know and the patient's kind of like, really like, I'm just, I'm sick. Okay, well, then what is wrong? When did this start? Um, and those are the types of questions that these doctors have to work with. And if they have more information, they're able to make more informed decisions about what tests to order and what kinds of things, what kinds of treatment plans that they can have for these patients. So we also can get into that driver's seat of being proactive with our medical records, right? So, and then the records of like teaching others around us, our family members, how to be more proactive with their care. I'm just saying. Uh, Alexandra says, um, I talked to my husband about going to the temp agency. <laughs> Thanks to you, Blue. <laughs> You're welcome. And he said, that's a genius idea. I said, that's why I follow her and I'm on Patreon. Well, there you go. <laughs> because with the temp agency, there's some people who foo-foo the temp agency. I, I know because I get the emails. People take the time to write me after I do a video trying to give you guys advice, they'll take the time to write me and they'll send me messages saying, Blue, I don't want to write, I don't want to go to a temp agency. I want a real job. You think I didn't want a real job when I started? I did. I wanted to go out there and start working right away, but that's not the way that this industry works. And I learned that. So that's why I'm passing it along to you guys because you guys can learn from what I went through so that you don't have to go through it. You know, it makes it a little bit easier for you, but that's the thing. When you go to the temp agency, they're going to give you these assignments that will, because their job is to get you a job. <laughs> if you are not making money, they are not making money. So that's why you want to make sure that you, you tell them, Hey, I'm available um, for a, this assignment or that assignment or this type of assignment or that type of assignment, you know? Um, and I think sometimes people will think that I mean like day labor. It's not day labor, guys. We're, we're technically trained. So that's not what I mean. When I say Google the um, temp agencies for medical professionals in your area, those are the ones that are going to come up that, you know, have the agency for medical professions. Sometimes it's for doctors. Sometimes it's for nurses. Sometimes it's for medical coders. And with those medical coder assignments, they're typically long-term assignments or like short-term assignments. It's never for a day. Don't think about it as, oh, I'm just going to work for a day. These are typically like, you know, months long. And so they hire a temp agency to get people in there. The employer is going to rely on the temp agency to go through the screening process, meaning that they want them to give them the test, the, like the people the test, so that way, if they fail it, you know, that that hospital had nothing to do with that situation. That was a temp agency. So the temp agency can say, well, yes, you passed or no, you didn't pass. So we need you to either study more or, you know, learn, learn a little bit more before you come back to us. They're going to check you out just like they checked me out. <laughs> they made sure that I was prepared. And when I took the, the assessment test, they were like, OK, you passed. We're going to look for a position for you and then we'll give you a call in a week. And I didn't believe them. I was like, oh, you know, whatever. <laughs> I've been hearing this. I'm jaded now. I don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> and sure enough, in a week, I got a call and it was a three month assignment. And so I was like, well, OK. And then the next one that I was on the other assignment, it was supposed to be a long term assignment for five years. And I was out of there in eight months because I had been applying to get into my forever home, which I am in now, you know? So it is possible to get your start in the temp agency. All of the assignments that you get put on is filler for your resume, all of it. And every single different place that you go to, again, is gonna make you more well-rounded. And that's what you want, you know? Um, Alexandra says, we don't have many temp agencies in North Carolina, but I will find the ones we have, <laughs> LOL, and utilize them. Yes, <laughs> that is awesome. But yes, you have to do that. Just try your best to be able to get in. And when you're applying for these jobs, you can apply for like the alternative positions as well. Medical biller, prior authorizations, 
you can apply to get into like release of information. And while release of information does not require you to know coding, it does require you to have HIPAA, which is a part of every single medical coding program, right? They, they teach you about HIPAA. So that's a skill you're already walking in with. And getting into the facility means that you will have a higher chance of being able to be hired within. So that's something that, you know, you're going to be the first in line when they have those positions open because, oh, yes, we know so-and-so who works over in release of information is also a medical coder. You know, maybe we can hire them. So that's the thing, guys. You have to kind of shuffle your way in there. It is not impossible, but a lot of people will get aggravated because everybody wants experience and that's what stops a lot of people it's not about the fact that they want experience they're gonna say that they want experience because who wants to hire somebody who has no experience and who you know does it who went through a, a fast-paced medical coding program and doesn't know so that's why i say if you have been studying that's going to put you you know ahead of the game because when you take these assessment tests you're going to be able to pass with flying colors. You're brand new with no bad habits. And you're going into a facility hungry to learn more. And that's what's going to prepare you for a really bright future. So that's why I tell people, don't get frustrated. Just keep applying. And when you have your resume, the resume is a huge part of it. And a lot of people don't think it is, but it is. Uh, because when you have your resume, and you're telling me that you're organized, you're a team player, and um, that you're always on time, and you have this in your skills list, I would reject that because that's not what um, medical coding positions want to see in those skills lists. In that skills list, you have to put things very direct and very, okay, ICD-10-CM, CPT, Hicks picks those are the things you want on there if you have icd-10 pcs training even if you got one of like the other credentials um, that doesn't include it the ccsp or the cpc and maybe you were taught the icd-10 pcs and maybe you understand it but you, again you have an outpatient credential that's okay you could still put it on your skills list okay because you know it right if you if you're comfortable with it go ahead and put it on there Medical terminology is another one. Anatomy and physiology is another one because those things are what is asked for in the job listings. And that's what you want because that's what that, sometimes the scanner is gonna pick up on if you have those skills listed on your skills list. They don't care that you're organized. They don't care that you're friendly, that you're a team player because everybody is, right? There's nothing more annoying than when I see that, you know? Or when I see ICD-10. Sometimes I see ICD-10 CM slash PCS. That's lazy. To me, I would reject that too. Because, wow, Blue, that's mean. Think about this. <laughs> we are very detailed. If you flip a number or, or a letter in, in a code, it's going to change the code completely. So that's why you want to make sure that you're very detailed. And each one needs to be on its own line. ICD-10 CM is different from ICD-10 PCS. They do not need to be on the same line. They need to be on two different lines. And if you have NCD, LCD edits on your, on your skills list, take that off. Because again, that's something that everybody knows and it doesn't need to be on your skills list. Those other ones that I said are gonna be your hard skills. And those are what needs to be there on your list. I'm just saying. Um, Medina says, exactly. I started off as a biller and then got promoted to a coding position when I first started. That's awesome. Hi, Yolanda. Thank you for the blue hearts. Um, hi, Blue. When do you host the Zoom Q&A on Patreon this month? Tomorrow or is it next Saturday? Um, it's tomorrow and I put out the uh, reminder. I believe I set it for five o'clock. Um, so you should have gotten a reminder. It should have posted. The reminder should have posted. Let me see. Uh, but it's at uh, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. It's 1 p.m. if you're on the Pacific Coast. And it is 4 p.m. if you... Uh, yeah, I did. The, the reminder posted already. So the Zoom link is there, um, Ilanda. And so that way, you know, you can just visit the Patreon page and the, the reminder for the Zoom link is there. Um, but yeah, so if you're on the East Coast, it's 4 p.m. Central Standard Time is 3 p.m. And on the Pacific Coast, 
it is 1 p.m. <laughs> um, tomorrow, Saturday. So, uh, Joanne says they have to train you on how to do things anyway, whether you're experienced or not. So it depends on what you put as your experience, what gets you noticed. There you go. So that's the thing, guys. And when you have exposure to different electronic medical records, that also goes on your skills list too. If you don't have any, that's okay because they are always going to train you on their electronic medical record. Every facility is different. Even like with Epic, Epic is different for different places because not everybody has the same package for Epic. You know, some facilities have a, a smaller package, some have a bigger package. So it really all depends on that facility and what they're doing there. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so to answer some of these questions that some of the people were posting the last couple of days that I wanted to get to. All right, so this one, it says, Hi, Blue. Um, I'm currently studying medical terminology in preparation for the CPC through AAPC. I'm new to everything. I was recently job searching and found that in my area, um, there are positions open to pharmacy tech trainees. I have no idea if I would get in, but would it be worth my time to invest in order to have a step into the medical world? I do realize that it might take me a bit away from putting all of my effort into medical coding, which is why I, I am uncertain. So when it comes to getting these additional, oh, should I get into scribe? Should I get into uh, pharmacy tech? Guys, these have nothing to do with medical coding. They will not help you to get into medical coding. So to go and spend money or to go through a pharmacy tech program, no, don't even do it. Because if that's what you want to do, then that's what you want to do. Because pharmacy tech is something completely different from medical coding. And again, they're not even related. That's, there's there's no way in relation that they have there. They're in the medical field, yes, but it's completely different. So no, I do not recommend getting scribe or you know uh, doing pharmacy tech in addition to the medical coding. If you want to do medical coding, that's what you need to concentrate on because that's where all your efforts <laughs> should be going. There's a lot to pharmacy tech, but again, that's that has nothing to do with medical coding. So I do not recommend that. Um, the other one is. Um, what certification did you have to teach providers? So you actually don't have to be certified when you're performing provider education. So last night <laughs> when I was talking about, um, some of my favorite stories and no, they were not meant to be scary stories. Somebody said, well, I thought it was going to be a scary story. Why would I say scary stories? And I didn't say it was scary stories, <laughs> um, scary stories, story time was just my experiences, which was what was asked of me, like to share some of my experiences in medical coding. So I talked about three of my favorite stories. And so one of them, I was talking about the fact that I do provider education. And that's one of the, my most favorite things that I love to do. You don't have to be certified to teach providers. When you are a medical coder, and if you look everywhere where it talks about medical coding, it does talk about um, the fact that we perform provider education or we have to educate our providers, not telling them, oh, if you document this, document this, document this, then you get this. That's not what we do. What we do is we make sure that all of the information that we need in order to be able to pick up the codes is there. And we make sure that we encourage them to document everything that happened because sometimes they'll think that, oh, well, we don't get credit for that, so I didn't document it. Well, how do you know, right? So everything needs to be documented. And like I said, it's just wrapped up in the many hats that we wear as a medical coder. We have to train other providers. We have to train each other. <laughs> and so that's just something that we do. But no, there's no particular certification for it. And you don't have to have it other than just some experience. Um, the first time I was asked to do an education presentation, it was for a group of residents at my second facility that I was at. And I had six months in <laughs> that I was a coder. And so that's what was just like, oh, okay. But I knew enough already, right, to be able to explain how evaluation and management goes, 
why it's important uh, to document the patient and their condition and all of the conditions that affect their ability to be able to treat that patient. So I was able to explain all of those things. And that's just a natural part of what we do as medical coders. We, again, wear a lot of hats. We look at documentation, we look for ways of improvement, we look for things that would make it easier for the provider as far as like, how can we help them to remember um, what they need to, to document or what they need to select or how can we help them to remember the stages of injury? <laughs> uh, because sometimes like when you think about it, right, with injuries, they get confused like, okay, Blue, how does it go again? Like they already were seen in the ER, and they're coming here, I'm not doing anything because they're still set in the cast, the cast looks good, and what do I do? That's a subsequent encounter for that patient because that uh, on the diagnosis side, I'm just talking about diagnosis, we're not talking about the procedure because that's something completely different. But when I'm talking about diagnosis, that's a subsequent because that patient is no longer in the active phase when we have that initial active phase at A at the end, that means this is their this is their first time receiving care, or maybe they're having to come back because like their fracture slipped out of place and they have to reset it again. That's still considered active treatment because the patient is not yet in the healing phase. And so explaining that to them and then like, you know, really going over it again and again, that helps them to remember. So those are things that we do as coders. So that's something that we all have to be prepared for. And that's another thing I get resistance of Blue, I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to have to talk to providers. I was very nervous too when I first started talking to providers because I used to think that, you know, I'm just a medical coder and, you know, uh, I'm looking at all of us as a whole, right? We either have a high school diploma or a GED and we have a certification and we have to be the ones to tell people who have had years of education and medical school, this is, this is what we need because this, according to the world of documentation and these rules in medical coding, this is what this means. And I have to be able to explain this to them. I have to be able to interpret the guidelines to them. And so that's when it was just like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So they, what you say does matter because I used to think it didn't matter, but yes, it does. And it wasn't until it was pointed out to me that yes, it does matter because we are the subject matter experts when it comes to medical coding. They have their job as providers. They provide care to the patients. That's why they depend on us to make sure that we understand these rules um, for the guidelines and we know how to properly code. We know the disease process so we can select the diagnosis codes appropriately. We understand the procedures so that we can get the appropriate procedure codes selected appropriately. So those are all the things that we do. And knowing that and how we are supposed to work together as a team, it took me time to realize that and to know it. But once I understood that, that's what I tell all of you. That's why I want you all to know that because it's important because I learned that one and it was just like, but once I got that, now it makes sense. Now what we do makes sense because not everybody understands what we do. <laughs> Trust me, there's a lot of people who act like they know, have no idea what we do. And so that's why we have to make it clear when we are in our position as medical coders, this is what we do. My providers understand the complexity of what I have to do because one time I broke it all down to them. I said, this is what I do. So I started walking them through the entire process and then by the time I was done walking them through the entire process of opening up the medical record, going through the list and <laughs> sorting it, and then opening up the record and going through the record, selecting the codes, changing the codes, updating the record, closing it out, putting it in there and putting it in this other system, and then, you know, checking it off on my list. Once I was done explaining all that, I had a room full of open mouth like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you did all that. And that's, that's for one record. Now I imagine my, my quota, right? When I have to do 90 of these in a day and some coders have to do 120. So again, <laughs> why when I explain things, it's very important. And this is why I tell my providers, this is why it's very important because we all have to work together. I want time to be able to look at your documentation. 
But the only way I'm going to be able to do that is if you make sure that you document everything. Because when there's something missing, I have to query you. And I don't like to query because it takes too much time. When you look at the anatomy of a query and how much time it takes, because you have to formulate that email or you have to formulate the form in order to be able to send it to them. So you have to think of how to say things and say it appropriately because you don't want to lead. You want them to be able to have options and you have to say it respectfully without, you know, making it sound like you're demanding anything or, you know, without making without making it seem like, again, like you're leading because that's not what you want to do. So you have to do all this. You have to submit it to them and then you have to wait. Then you have to move on to the next record. And then when you move on to the next record, the next day you have to come back and see if they responded to that query. And if they didn't, you have to wait another day. And then by the time you know it, a whole week can go by. Well, meanwhile, you still have to keep going. And so I always say the anatomy of one query can be up to one hour because by the time you get done with all that time, and that's one query can suck up an entire hour. So while you may think, oh, it takes two minutes to do a query. Okay. But you still have to wait for that query to come back. And then you have to look at the documentation again to make sure that it's actually appropriate because how many times have we uh, as coders queried the the query comes back responded to and it's still not right it's still missing something or the provider gets upset and just like i don't understand what you want me to do so now you got to go hunt them <laughs> you got to go track them down you got to go talk to them and while it's nice because i'm actually in the facility and i can see them every day um, sometimes I have to go back there and chase them in their office and sometimes they're with patients or they're up in the OR and again, I have to wait. So all of these things take time and all for one thing. This is why I say it's very important to keep those queries to a minimum and they like it when they don't have to get queried all the time, <laughs> but sometimes we fall off and we have to be reminded. <laughs> so, all right. What did I miss? Let's see. Um, Alexandra says, yes, and thanks for sharing last night. Glass says, hi, Blue. I went to your website because I was trying to sign up for your personal one-on-one -on -one virtual tutoring, but I didn't see any times available. How can I book a time with you? Um, Joanne says, rule number one, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, yes, the query process is time consuming. And a lot of people don't think about that, right? And so that's the thing I say. We've got to keep those queries to a minimum but glass for your um for your question about uh booking the times so patreon is patreon and i think that's where you meant that you went to because i don't have a website um i always tell people if you want to book a session with me for tutoring or professional coaching or any of those things you email me and then I will let you know what my av availability is because sometimes there's some weeks where like I have no availability and um, <laughs> for the next three weeks, Monday and Tuesday, Monday and Thursday are all booked up. So for the next three weeks. So that's why, I mean, if you want to do that, reach out to me by email medical coding with blue and blue is B-L-E-U at gmail.com. And all of my information is in the description box below. And, um, so then you email me and we set up a time and then you pay me through Zelle because that's the only, um, party payer I take. <laughs> and then I will send you the zoom link, uh, once all of that's squared away. So hopefully that answers your question, <laughs> but yeah, that's what it is. That's what I do for my sessions. Um, all right. So. The other one was, there was another one. Was there another one? I had one more. Do, 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 do. Or did I already read it? I don't think I did. No. Yes. Okay. I'm looking back on my questions now because I thought I had one more question. Because, you know, sometimes people get upset with me when I don't answer questions right away. Um, oh, yes, I had one more. Um, 
She says, thank you, Blue, for keeping it real. I'm a stay-at-home mom with no previous medical field background. I will be honest and say that I have thought about working from home, but only because I live in a rural area. I will definitely be making that 35-minute commute <laughs> to get the internship slash experience under my belt before looking for work remotely. Any advice for a stay-at-home mom newbie? So when it comes to, like being brand new and you're a stay-at-home mom and this is why you want to um, do medical coding because you heard you can do this remotely and this is what you want to do because you want to be able to spend time with your kids children can be a distraction especially when it comes to trying to concentrate on a record because once you get into that concentration mode of being in the medical record, it is very difficult when you have your concentration broken. Like if you have a child that is really small and they need your constant attention, that's what you need to be spending your time with is your child, right? Um, but you have to treat working at home like you would being at the office, meaning that you do need to get up. You do need to, you know, fix yourself up as far as like, you know, okay, you need to be ready to go because some people say, oh, it's the greatest thing. I get to roll out of bed. I don't have to brush my teeth and I don't have to brush my hair and I could just sit down and do my work. Well, keep in mind that your brain gets into that frame of mind like, okay, we're not doing anything important because we didn't get up and do our normal routine that we would do if we're going to work. So this is why I say it's important to get up, get dressed like you would be going to the office. You never know because sometimes for some places they want you to be camera ready because in case you get a call or you have to go to a meeting or whatever you're going to be ready for that but you know thinking that you can work from home and just to be with your kids and and that's that's your sole focus and especially if you tell the people that you're interviewing with because they're going to ask you why do you want to work remotely and if you say oh well you know i have small children at the house you are not going to get a call you're probably not going to get a call i should say <laughs> because they're gonna know that you're distracted. It's not that because you have children, it's because you've already admitted that you are gonna be distracted. And yes, there are people out there who say, oh, well, I'm just gonna start work and then I'm gonna go run out and run an errand. I'm gonna let my boss know and then I'm gonna come back and be able to do whatever. Not all bosses are gonna be as liberal with the time, okay? And so there's a lot of things that go into that as well. You can't just treat it like you're going out willy nilly. Because even when you have your computer up, they're going to be looking about how much time you spend in each medical record. Because, oh, trust and believe, the second you open that record, your name and the timestamp is on it. And it's counting down the time. How much time are you spending in this record? So if, you're, if it's showing that you spent an hour and 20 minutes in this record, and it was, say for instance, an appendectomy where you could be in and out <laughs> because that's a pretty well straightforward if it's got all the documentation, it's a straightforward procedure. And you spend an hour and 20 minutes in it, they may say, well, why did you spend an hour and 20 minutes in there if it's just an appendectomy? What's going on? So they're gonna know that either you walked away from your desk or you were doing something else that you weren't supposed to be doing. So that's the thing that you have to think about. A lot of people don't think about that. Oh, I can just pretend like I'm there or I can use one of those little mouse mover things <laughs> and it'll show that I'm online. Well, yeah, but when they go in, they audit, you know, how long you've been in that record, mm, what's going on here? Or if you can't keep up with production, they're gonna look at how long you've been in those records. Now, it's one thing if you're actually working in it, you're working in that record and you get stuck because it is a difficult record. <laughs> yeah, that does happen. I worked at a level one trauma hospital and remotely and that I did get stuck in some of them because it's a lot. You know, when you work level one traumas, you see a lot. <laughs> so those sometimes do take time, but not all records are going to take time. So they know all the tricks. These these remote companies, they do know all the tricks. So they know if you're if you're not showing that you're meeting production standards, you're you're not meeting accuracy standards. If you're not meeting accuracy, you probably need remedial training, or you need um, just to time to focus because if you're distracted it's going to show in your coding too so there's a lot of ways that people think oh yeah i can cut corners and do this and do that and it'll show okay so you don't want to be let go from a job because you couldn't meet productivity you couldn't meet accuracy now there are some employers where 
you know, they'll cut you a break and say, yeah, we'll recommend you for another place. But again, if you're showing that same work ethic for the next place, you're going to get a reputation. Medical coders all have reputations. <laughs> Trust me. And I see a lot of them on LinkedIn where, you know, you have your public persona on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the format for all of us, right? For, for medical coders. And if you're a medical coder, you're on there. And you can start to see like people's personality and, you know, okay, this is a hard worker or this person is this or this person is that. So you start to get a <laughs> your own um, identity when it comes to this and people will know you. I'm sure there's a bunch of people who say they know me and I know I don't even know them, <laughs> but they know me because of either the channel or being on uh, on uh, LinkedIn, you know, so or even. Instagram because people have found me on Instagram and that's how they discovered the channel that's how they discovered me on LinkedIn so those are things that you have to think about and if you get a reputation for being somebody that's kind of a slacker that's gonna follow you everywhere because it's not that people get blackballed because not everybody knows everybody but you do get to have a reputation so that's why it's important that if you are working at home that you need to be focused on why you're working at home. If they ask you and you do have children at the house, but you say that you can work with your children in the house, okay, you don't need to be mentioning that to the employer. What you need to be talking about with the employer is why do you want to be working at home? I am more comfortable in my house. It is more, you know, it's easier for me to be able to pay attention to what I'm doing. I don't get distracted because I am comfortable in my familiar surroundings. That's the kind of thing that you wanna talk about. You don't wanna talk about your kids and oh this and oh that. You talk about your kids when you're actually in the job. You don't talk about your kids when you're trying to get the job. Because again, you don't want to put off the, the thing that you are in this because you wanna be at home because they're gonna know that you're distracted. Okay, so that's just something that, I mean, it's just my advice when, when it comes to that. And I know people are proud of their kids, and I get that. I understand that. I'm not a mother, but I understand being proud of children. So, um, but work is work. And drama is drama. <laughs> not that kids are drama, but sometimes people will say, oh, well, you know, they'll talk about, like, their, their, their significant other, and that's why they're doing this, and this, and that, and that kind of thing. Again, that's trauma. <laughs> You don't want to talk about drama. You want to talk about why do you love the field of medical coding? You need to think about what did you do in your past that can translate into this. As far as like, okay, um, I, I was waitstaff. Let's just say I was waitstaff. Okay, I worked around a lot of personalities. I was able to diffuse a lot of conflict because, you know, you get customers that get really upset. Hey, that's something that we need as a, in medical coders because... We need people who can work around a variety of personalities because, hello, <laughs> our providers can sometimes have their own little personalities, right? They can either be like really, you know, or <laughs> they can be really nice. So it really all depends. And you need somebody who's going to be well-rounded. Hey, I can work with anybody. All right. We need people who are confident. Again, somebody who can do conflict resolution is somebody who's very confident. You know, somebody who is leaning in during the uh, the interview and not just all kind of laid back and like, hey, man, you know, they're not like that. They're like, hey, this is what I know. And being confident is going to go a long way into getting you in to the job and getting them to trust you to work at home by yourself. Because that's the other thing, too. If you are brand new to this field, <laughs> it is possible to work at home when you're brand new. But it is difficult to get in. And the reason that I say that it's difficult to get in, because before the pandemic started, you had to have three to five years experience, period, end of story. If you did not have three to five years experience, you were not going to get in at all. But then the pandemic happened and they were like, okay, well, we need people. So we're going to go ahead and hire these new people who have no experience. And they've been able to make it through. And I'm sure some of them fell a couple of times, but they were able to get up and keep going, and which is great. But this is something that you have to be prepared for because when you're working remotely, these records are going to look a lot different from these books. <laughs> the books are going to have everything that you need and they're going to be Mickey Mouse compared to 
what you have coming to you, which is these records from all kinds of providers who are trained all different ways. And remember, not everybody has the same teaching, which is why I would love for providers to be able to have a class in medical school about documentation. That would be so great because if you catch them early, <laughs> that's always the goal, right? Is to catch them early. So that way they can get used to documenting well. Then we wouldn't have issues, right? Uh, I shared an article on my uh, LinkedIn channel or my LinkedIn page about um, a doctor who actually had to pay um, a family member of a patient uh, like a little over two million because the patient, of course, expired. But um, they said it was either probably lack of documentation. So that's something that we have to drive home all the time is that documentation. But again, book coding and real world coding are two different things. And so when you are brand new, you have to be prepared to do your research. And by doing your research, I mean, like, if you get stuck on, is this related to this condition or not? Don't go running to your lead. Don't go running to your supervisor and saying, um, is this a symptom of this disease? No, <laughs> you go to Google <laughs> and you say, is this symptom a symptom of this disease or um, what are the symptoms of whatever disease it is? And then you see if that symptom is related to that. And if it is, then you know that you don't pick that up. So those are things that you can do to make it easy for yourself so that you're not running back and forth to people who have their jobs to do as well. So, <laughs> uh, but yes, treat it like you're going to the office. It's not a picnic. Um, make sure that you set up your area well and that like your monitors are facing a wall so that nobody can sneak up behind you because you still have to protect these records even though you're at home. And even though you say, well, Blue, it's just my kids. If your kids are old enough to read and they look at your screen, you've just committed a HIPAA violation. Why? Because those kids had a, did not have a need to know for whatever's in that medical record. And it doesn't matter how old they are. Because again, you have to protect that information. Think about how you would feel if this was your medical record and maybe you were having a private um, encounter with a doctor and they had all your private details and then you have some teenager looking at your medical record. Would you like that? Because somebody let their kid look at the screen too. So that's why you have to think about how you would feel and you have to be protective with this information all the time. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> Joanne says that's when Dr. Bates <laughs> comes in, uh, keeps doctors in communication with you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the bear trap, which is my candy basket. <laughs> Dr. Bates, I like that. <laughs> Hi, Deanne. Thank you for the blue heart. Yes, uh, Microsoft Teams does track you. Joanne says, and many places have strict HIPAA codes working from home. There you go. Um, Jamie says, yes, they really need to have... Um, they really need to learn to document right. And yes, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> uh, but until then, we have to be, you know, the ones who, who go out and who make that effort to talk to providers because providers will not go and find you. You have to be the proactive one. There are some providers that will be proactive and seek you out, but a lot of them won't because they're not going to want to ask you for help because they're going to say, oh, well, the coder doesn't know. And a lot of them say that. There's a lot of people who say that. Now, my providers know they cannot say that <laughs> about me because when they say, well, go ask Blue. And I've seen them do it. Go ask Blue because Blue's going to know. Yes, I am going to know because I make the effort. And if I don't know something, I don't tell them I don't know. What I do is give me uh, some time and I'll do some research and I'll get back to you on that. And I get back to them. Okay, so don't ever tell a provider that you don't know something. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So I think that was all the questions that I had. So hopefully that answers the uh, stay at home mom question. Or if you are a stay at home dad, you know, <laughs> stay at home parent, um, that uh, advice applies to you as well. All right. So, and I didn't see any other questions in the chat box let's see all right so 
How are you all doing with the coding guidelines challenge? Are y'all still hanging in there? <laughs> um, Court, did I not answer your question? I thought I did, which yes, I did. You can use either the Ahima books or the Optum books. And I know I said use the Optum books. That's just my advice anyway. So Court, you can use the Optum books. I would recommend those because I always recommend those. I don't recommend the Ahima books. I am all the way with the Ahima. But when it comes to the books that you can use, I trust Optum. Because the, uh, I don't know if you're using PCS, but if you are, the ICD-10 PCS book, it has um, exercises in the back, in Appendix M like in Mary, and in Appendix N like in Nancy, they have all of the answers. So that way you can go through this if you are studying for the CCS exam, the CCA exam, or the CIC exam. This book is the one that I recommend. For PCS, I don't recommend any other publisher other than Optum because Optum has all of the uh, quizzes in the back. It's got the answers and it gives you a really good workout. The whole book will be worked out if you go through all of those because there are hundreds of procedures to look up. And I do recommend going through every single one of them because when I studied for the CCS exam, the gold standard of medical coding credentials, <laughs> And I passed it, but I have no inpatient medical coding experience, like actually being in the inpatient setting and coding for through PCS. So I went through all of those procedures back there and I coded them all. And that was what gave me confidence to be prepared for the exam. So if you are sitting for that exam, this is the book that I recommend. Um, I think it's, the American Medical Association that makes their PCS book too as well. And they have the same um, the same quiz in their book. So just so you know, you can get that one as well. But I do recommend Optum. For the diagnosis book, the ICD-10 CM book, um, before every single chapter, there are examples of the codes and how they apply and the explanation and all of the rationale as to, excuse me, how they got to that. So before every single chapter, they do give you examples on how to use those codes. When you are studying, I recommend either working through, like covering up the answers and looking up the codes and see if you can get those codes yourself or just reading it and reading the rationale as to why. But these are really good examples in here They've got really good um, uh, anatomy plates and everything else in here too as well. So I do recommend Optum. If y'all are asking me what books I recommend, this is not an ad, but I recommend Optum 360 coding books. I will always recommend Optum. If you've watched my channel for more than five minutes, <laughs> you know that I love Optum. And only because it they're just so comprehensive. There's a lot of good tips throughout the book. There's a lot of things in here that are not covered in a lot of other books. Some people say, well, I'm using the AMA version. I'm using the AHIMA version. I'm using the AAPC version. And that's okay. If you want to use those, that's fine. But you're asking me what I know and what I trust, you Optum. <laughs> All right. Yes, Optum is the best. <laughs> Jamie, they call me and my coworker <laughs> the coding and billing police. <laughs> That's funny. Elanda, I just read the coding guidelines for the third time today. Yay! <laughs> Hi, Heidi. Um, Court, thanks. Optum just received them. Good. Uh, Joanne says, my coding school didn't teach us how to pull relevant information from the charts. This is why many years ago, this was many years ago, so I hope they've corrected that uneducation. <laughs> Well, I hope so too, because unfortunately there's a lot of bad programs like that that don't teach. They just have like, you know, everything online and they have modules and things like that. And then you're left to learn on your own. I tell people this all the time. We have to learn things on our own. And it doesn't matter what the schools said, because sometimes the schools will say, oh yeah, there's going to be a teacher for you. And then the student finds out that they have to wait weeks for their question to be answered. 
because that teacher has like a thousand students they have to go through. So that's something that you have to be prepared for. But I mean, I can only say so much <laughs> so many times because I feel like a lot of videos, I sound like a broken record when I tell people you have to study on your own. And I don't know if people believe me. And then they get into the program and they're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is what she was talking about. I'm just saying. But, yeah, it's programs like that that don't teach about, like, abstracting diagnoses or procedures that really kind of make it difficult for the rest of us, you know, that are brand new when you're brand new. Because that's what they think all medical coders are like when they go through these fast paced medical coding programs, because at the end of the day, these schools are a business. And sometimes the people that are like running the schools have never been a medical coder. Some of them, they're just there to sell a program and they don't know a whole lot. Cause I know because I'll see, I'll see them ignorantly tell people, Oh yes, you need the CPC and you need the CCS. Why? When the CCS covers what the CPC has, and then some. Why do you need them both? Oh, so that you can apply to more than one place. Okay, well, let's look at the job listings then, shall we? When you look at the job listings, do you ever see them say candidate must have the CCS and the CPC? No. You know why? Because the CCS covers inpatient and outpatient medical coding. The CPC only covers the outpatient side. So if you are wanting just the outpatient coder, of course, either one of these will work. You don't need them both. When you get both, it's going to cost you more money. And this is what I keep telling people. But some people are just like, I don't know. They're just like, okay. <laughs> With AAPC, you have to pay the $190 every single year for the membership to have the credential. If you don't, they'll take your credential away. Okay. So it's $190 a year times two because every, every two years you're cycling every two years. So in that two years time that you're paying $190 twice, you still have to come up with 36 continuing education units for one CPC, right? Just, just for one. Now, if you get additional credentials, we're not talking about that right now, but for one, it's 36. With a HEMA, one medical coding certification, the CCS, CCA, CCSP, 20 for one. There's no membership fee that you have to pay. If you don't wanna be a member, that's fine. A HEMA says, okay, but we're gonna charge you a separate fee to report your CEUs, which is understandable, it's their, their administrative costs. Okay, but AAPC is $190 every single year. So these schools that are pushing you to, to sit for both, because I see them out there and it disgusts me, because why are you making people do this and they only need one? And they're trying to change their life. And a lot of times people don't know, like, what do I do? <laughs> Which way do I go? You just need to pick one. But that CCS is the gold standard of medical coding credentials for a reason. It is the mastery <laughs> of medical coding. And that says that you know both, that you've mastered both. The CCA says you have the entry level competence and it has the most domains tested of any medical coding certification. You know, yes, I know AAPC has all of their, there's broken down into the different subjects in CPT. Uh, but this really kind of counted as one, one domain, because it's all procedure coding, right? And then, of course, they have their other things that they test on. But the one who tests the most for entry-level people is the CCA. And again, that says you can code both inpatient and outpatient coding. So again, it's another heavyweight. All of, all of the credentials are heavyweights. But it takes somebody who understands them, and not everybody understands them. So, um, and, and what they mean, Right. So even these hiring folks, you know, they're just like, oh, you know, you need this and you need this. No, all you need is one. I'm just saying. Alexis says, did anyone study as hard with the guidelines by writing everything out <laughs> through the course of study and the manual itself? Am I holding myself back with self-study, with self-pace in the way that I'm studying? Let me get, let me answer that one in just a second, Alexis. Um, Alexandria says, Alexis, if you are learning and bettering yourself, you are not doing anything wrong good for you. Um, B says, Alexis, I am doing that now, reading a chapter, writing, typing a summary of the keywords for that chapter, and then recording myself reading the breakdown. Wings, 
Can you apply the CEUs earned for two different credentials or do they have to be different credits? What's the challenge? Okay, B says, what's the challenge? So the challenge is, um, I issued this challenge at the beginning of the month in October. The beginning of the month of October because the new 2023 guidelines came out, right? And it was to read the ICD-10 CM coding guidelines four times for the month of October. And I said, this, this comes out to a one time per week. And so <laughs> while some people have been on track and they're going to do it, uh, some people said, okay, Blue, well, I, I wasn't able to finish it in a week, so I guess I lost then. No, you keep reading. And if it takes you the whole month to read the guidelines once, it takes you the whole month to read the guidelines once. The point is, is that you're getting through the guidelines. And then if you can get through it a second time, that's even better. If you can get through it a third time, that's wonderful. If you can only get through it three times this month, that is, that is fantastic. If you can get through it four times, that's really good because it's helping to develop one, your speed in reading, because if you are going to take any of the certification exams, you have to be prepared to read fast. Uh, number two, it's going to help you to be able to absorb a lot of information more quickly and you're going to be able to take it all in because you're having exposure to a lot of information all at one time. Because there's sometimes when people want to get like these books, these workbooks, Oh, Blue, tell me the workbooks where they have these um, these op notes and things like that so I can work on those op notes. Okay, have you been reading your coding guidelines? Well, no. Okay, so how are you supposed to do that effectively without knowing your guidelines first? You have to know your guidelines before you can start in on all that other stuff because those guidelines are going to help you to know what codes to select in the in the sequence to put them in if you know the guidelines. You don't have to memorize them, which... I'm going to get back to this, this comment here um, from Alexis, writing things out. <laughs> so some people were telling me that, Blue, I want to write it out. And um, I accept the challenge, but I want to write it out. Okay, so if you're writing it out, that's a lot of writing. That's a lot of writing. And yes, it's going to take a little bit longer. Is it good? Sure. But you may be burning yourself out if this is what you start to do. So what I said, if you want to write things down, that's great. But how about this? When you're going through the section, like say, for instance, you're reading the coding guidelines from your book. It's like 36 pages, right? And so you break it down to about five pages per day. And in that five pages, you're reading about sepsis. So you decide, hey, I really want to make sure that the sepsis guidelines sticks in my brain. Let me write out the sepsis guidelines. So you write those out, but yet you continue to read the rest of the passages for those five pages that you have assigned yourself for the day. Okay, great. Well, now guess what? This means that you've got that part in your brain. You didn't write out the whole thing, but you wrote out the sepsis part. It's going to be a lot more familiar to you the second time you come back to it, right? Once you finish reading the guidelines for that week, and then you come back to it again, you won't have to write out the sepsis guidelines again. So maybe you decide to write out the guidelines about the facetious disorder. So you start writing that out, right? And you already know about the sepsis guidelines. You, you're writing out now about the facetious guidelines, right? <laughs> for behavioral health, right? And so, okay, that's another one that you did. So you're just kind of like patchworking little ones to kind of like, okay, you're writing them out. It's helping to keep in your brain. And that way you can just study that way. That way you're not writing out the whole thing and you're still making progress, right? Because you may be gung-ho one day to write it all out. But once you start writing it, you're going to get physically tired because it does wear on you. But if you give yourself that break and you say, well, I'm going to write them out. I'm going to write out just a section and then I'm going to look at everything else. I'm going to read everything else or I'm going to write the diabetes guidelines, but I'm going to write it out over a couple of days because this is a lot for me to write out. That's okay too. So when you do stuff like that, it changes up how you're learning. You're not feeling bogged down. You're not feeling like you're not accomplishing something because by the end of the week you've written out. And if you pick one section to write out every day, if you want to write the stuff out, look how much writing you're going to have at the end of the week. All that stuff adds up. And then if you cycle through another week and you write down another set of the guidelines, uh, another section of the guidelines, hey, that's even better. But 
don't work so hard where you're going to burn yourself out. That's the only thing that I'm recommending to you guys. Now, while I always recommend flashcards, it's a lot and you don't have to memorize these. The goal of reading the guidelines is to get yourself worked into, okay, I'm seeing all this information. I'm able to process this information more efficiently because my brain is getting used to reading a lot more and it's not just getting bogged down with, oh my gosh, I got to write all of these guidelines out. But if you want to write them out, that's okay. I will never discourage that. But what I will say is this, don't burn yourself out. So if you want to write down a section at a time, that's a much more attainable goal. And I think it's much more easier for you on your body <laughs> that you're not going to get so tired and you're not going to resist the guidelines. It's going to be just a little bit more and a little bit more. And it's making you a tougher coder. I'm telling you, knowing <laughs> these guidelines. Somebody commented that she extended the uh, challenge to her coworkers to read the coding guidelines. And she's gotten through it one and a half times already. And now her coworkers are coming to her instead of reading the coding guidelines because they know she knows the guidelines. So what I would say in that situation is, okay, I'm doing the guidelines challenge. You can do the guidelines challenge too. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, you know, that's something that, you know, you could do because once you start reading these, nobody can take that from you. Nobody. And if you don't have the latest book, if you have only the 2022 book, which has last year's guidelines in it, and you don't have the 2023 book, that's okay because you could still go to cms.gov and download the ICD-10 CM coding guidelines 2023. Now, do not ask me for the specific link because this is the part where I'm going to tell you this is where we need to learn to do our research. You can go to Google, you can type in CMS, ICD-10 CM um, C, uh, coding guidelines 2023. And that PDF will pop up so that you can download it for free and then you can read them. Now it's 115 pages or so, um, the, the downloaded online version, but it's only because of the font size. <laughs> don't, don't get scared on the, on the size. And you can break it up into, you know, however much you want to read in a day. If you want to read 10 pages per day, obviously it's going to take you a little over 10 days to go through those coding guidelines. So that would mean that you're going to go through the guidelines like three times in the month of October. That's okay. That's still going to be good. And I still say that's great. If you even made it through one time, that's still great. Because my, again, my channel is to build stronger medical coders. And the way that you become strong in medical coding, know those guidelines. Then nobody can mess with you. Not even an auditor who has years of experience can mess with you if you know your coding guidelines. If you can say, well, no, wait a second. <laughs> because even veteran coders are guilty of not reading their coding guidelines every year. And some of them forget. And some of them just kind of get in complacent, right? Complacent with um, the guidelines and what they know instead of refreshing every year. So this is how people say, oh, we've always done it this way. That's a dangerous thing to say in medical coding because things change every year. So that's why you have to read your coding guidelines. Well, Blue, I've gone to those, um, those uh, seminars where they talk about the updates for the latest coding guidelines. But did you read the coding guidelines? Well, no, but I went to the, okay. Going through an update class where they talk about the updates for, for the guidelines is one thing. Reading the coding guidelines is another. And trust me, it's a, it will make a lot more sense <laughs> rather than getting the Notes version. Anybody can get the Notes version from, um, from the internet. Anybody. But actually reading the fresh set of guidelines is going to go a long way for you. Be a lot easier. All right. So let's see. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh oh, what did I miss? Um, Alexandra says, I have to catch up some tomorrow on my day off. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Samantha, if I intend to eventually obtain the CCS, would you recommend starting with a CPC or a CCA? You can start with a CCA if you want to. Um, Alexis says, thank you, Alexandria. I have to write, read and write to gain competence. And then I believe I'll master the CCS. 
Um, taking the CCS will be about nine months after completing the course that I took. Okay. Um, yes, Alexis, please don't give up on yourself. Do what works best for you because you will, we all learn different. Mm -hmm. And we all learn at different speeds too. Just keep moving forward. The challenge is to read the ICD-10 CM coding guidelines four times in the month of October. Um, by the way, by the time... Okay, by the way, would the time I began my course of study and successfully completing the CCS would be one to two years of experience? Um, that the, okay, wait, by the time, by the way, would the time I began my course of study and successfully completing the CCS would be one to two years of experience and that the new employer is asking Sometimes they will accept education in lieu of experience, but the way that you're doing it, that's not what they would be accepting. I mean, as far as like, oh yeah, you went through a formal program, you know, or whatever, and that was, that's going to be your experience instead. Um, if it takes you one to two years before you, that, that's really very long to sit for the uh, CCS. Um, I've always said nine months, 12 months, or 18 months is ideal uh, but if you go a little bit longer than that, I mean, obviously that's more time to study, but that's not everybody's, not everybody's going to be able to do that. So um, I would recommend 18 months on the outside um, for taking your test, your CCS. And again, um, when you're coming, when you're coming in with no experience, they're going to look at your education and what you know. Having the CCS is a, obviously a great start and it's a, a wonderful way to go but they're gonna expect you to know how to code. And when you are sitting for their assessment tests and as long as you can pass them, that's gonna put you you know, at the head of the line. But again, you have to know by going through the workbooks and all the workbooks that I recommended there in the description box below on any of my videos, um, that's what they're gonna be looking at is your, be able, your ability to be able to process you know, these scenarios that they're going to give you. Okay. Uh, but it's not considered experience. ATL says I've been reading. Yay, <laughs> Alexis, or could I leverage skills from other trainings um, to gain at least three years of experience? Um, Alexandra says, uh, usually not Alexis, the employers want real life experience. Uh, but you can put the skills that you've learned on your new resume along with your education. Court, I'm reading the coding, the ICD 10 CM coding guidelines now reminds me of ICD 9 guidelines, some similarities. Smith, my name is B L E U. Thanks, Blue. I'm going to try this. I need to, I need to new, I guess, do new filler encoder training. <laughs> um, uh, Yes, the encoder dumbs you down. It does. It really does. Um, Alexandra says, I love books, just not not just my coding books. <laughs> uh, Mahogany, thank you so much for sharing pertinent info. Alexandra Blue has great videos and experience and resumes, etc. Um, I'm just no expert. <laughs> Trust me, this would took years of experience, and even I still say that I have a lot to learn. I still have a lot to learn. I'm just saying, you know, because if it's one thing that coding will do to you is it will humble you. Last year when I was going through taking the test, right, I took my CCSP and then when I passed it in March, I was going through a CDI boot camp <laughs> and the one that I recommend is the one from, um, oh, I just had it in my head. HC Pro. They have a really good one. It's kind of expensive, but it's really good. Um, but that CDI program, whoo, 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 that'll make you wonder, do you know anything? <laughs> and so that's how you know the program is really good. It's when it makes you wonder, do I know anything? You know, because it's really challenging you. And trust me, that CDI program, the inpatient coding boot camp, which they also have, it was really good and it helped to kind of fill in some of the areas that I didn't know. But that CDI boot camp, that was a real challenge. And that then I knew, okay, I have a little bit more work to do <laughs> when it comes to CDI. CDI is not fooling around. 
right? And the gold standard of, of uh, CDI credentials is through ACTIS. That's the Association for Clinical Documentation Improvement Specialists. And they are the gold standard. Um, AHIMA has their CDI credential, the CDIP. Um, AAPC has theirs as well. But when you are looking at getting the gold standard, you want to go through ACTIS. I'm just going to say that, you know. Um, AHIMA is a wonderful organization when it comes to, of course, the uh, degree certification designations and, of course, the medical coding credentials. <laughs> but their CDI is, um, when it comes to CDI, ACTIS is the way to go. I'm just going to say that. Um, uh, that's okay. <laughs> I am a CPCA and new, uh, and new job doing billing and coding, and I need to do the challenge. I am going to do this. Yay! That's good. <laughs> um, that is awesome. Uh, Alexa says, I need to join you, Blue, um, on a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Well, like I said, um, if you want to book an appointment right now, the uh, fee for one-on-ones uh, for either tutoring or professional coaching, or if you just like, hey, Blue, I just don't know where to go, you know, as far as like career-wise, that's professional coaching. Um, right now, the fee is $35 an hour. So if you're interested in that, um, let me know. Just email me and we can set up a session. Um, but that's, that's that. If you want to join my uh, Patreon channel, Patreon has a lot of exercises uh, for coding. That's where I do all of my coding stuff there. Because <laughs> when I try to do it here on YouTube, it doesn't get a very, like, like it doesn't get a response. Like, nobody watches. And it's just like, all that work. <laughs> so I put it all on my Patreon channel. Now, Patreon, I do have once a month um, study hall. Now, the study hall is going to be, the one for this month is going to be tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. So it typically goes on for a little over an hour and you just come in and then if you have questions or whatever, you can, uh, it's on Zoom so everybody can see everybody. You don't have to turn your camera on if you don't want to, but um, for my Patreons that are at the $10 pledge level and above, um, they get access to that. So. I mean, it's just a great open forum <laughs> to be able to talk, uh, talk out questions and things. And then plus you get to hear from other people who have questions too. And so these are other people who are either studying or they're going through the same thing that you are. So I think that it's really great. And I've had a positive response from it like the last few times that I've done it. Because I tried to do like, excuse me, Patreon Jeopardy, which was a lot of fun. But uh, a lot of people... <laughs> would um, either miss it or you know they couldn't make it at the time so uh, the study hall seems to be doing really well so <laughs> uh, we're gonna keep doing study halls then so but yeah tomorrow um, at uh, at that time 3 p.m. Central Standard Time is gonna be on and so we'll just be there to chatting and seeing what's going on <laughs> and I'll have all my books <laughs> um, uh, Joanne says that challenge is a thousand percent better <laughs> than some of these things that get posted on TikTok for sure. And that's the thing with TikTok. People have asked me to get on TikTok. They're like, Blue, get on TikTok. Blue, get on TikTok. I'm so resistant to TikTok. And do you know why? Because I don't believe in the conditioning of us getting like these little snippets. Because TikTok is like 60 seconds and less, right? And I think that when you try to shove a lot of information into 60 seconds or less, and then people get used to this, and this is what they want, these little short, short things, and they're, the attention span for people gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And when you are in a field like medical coding, this is something that we cannot have. We cannot have things short, 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 because then you're going to confuse people a lot more, and people are going to get a lot more confused. So that's why whenever people have told me before on my channel, they say, well, Blue, um, my, my video started to go like 20 minutes. And now that's that's usually the minimum is 20 minutes, like 18 to 20 minutes, 24 minutes sometimes is my videos. And they're like, you need to shorten your videos. No, because I'm trying to explain something. I want people to understand. And you can't just be flashing people with information. You can't do that. Because to me, that does nobody any good. And I don't like that. I have never liked that. I just, ugh, you know what I mean? I just don't. I don't like it. And to me, I don't. Just like somebody said earlier that the encoder will dumb you down. When you do that, you do that too much with the little short information. It's, it's 
it's no good guys it's no good and like i'm saying <laughs> i like to explain things because i like detail and if people are too a short attention span for it i mean i i don't know what to say <laughs> you know I, I can't help you then i guess um uh, Jackie says my hospital uses RNs for CDI. I never, I could never do CDI. <laughs> I'm good with coding my inpatient charts. You're probably better at it than you think you might think, but CDI is next level. And for nurses who do CDI, I always tell them, you know, they tell me, well, blue, I want to do CDI. And I said, okay, well, what experience do you have medical coding? Oh, I don't do medical coding. Okay. Then how do you know? what medical coders need and how do you know to understand the coder if you're the liaison right the cdi is a liaison between the provider and the coder because the goal of the cdi is to be able to help the provider to improve the documentation that's a coder's job right but the coder doesn't always have next level knowledge unless they study right but they don't always have the next level knowledge to understand like medications and procedures and, and what other tests are going to be run. Whereas a nurse could look at a thing and say, okay, yeah, there's something here that's missing because they have that clinical knowledge, right? But if you have the time in and you have all those years of study, then yeah, you uh, somebody who's not a nurse can definitely be a CDI. But at the same time, it takes a lot of time and energy into studying. <laughs> uh, but that CDI needs to be able to understand what the coders are trying to say because the cdi could hear from a coder well this is the issue that we're having with this and the the cdi nurse may be able to say oh no i don't think that's important and they just dismiss the coder not really thinking about what the coder is saying because sometimes the coder doesn't have enough clinical knowledge or even experience in to be able to um say what they're trying to say because sometimes it's sometimes it's difficult to ask the question let alone to a professional, because sometimes people get real intimidated by, well, I'm a nurse or I'm a doctor and, you know, you can't tell me what to do or you can't you can't say this or you can't say that. And a coder would be like, oh, OK, because, you know, I don't know anything. But in actuality, yes, we do. We just have to put a little bit more effort in. And so that's why I say that if a CDI is a nurse and they've been on the coding side or they've taken a coding course and they understand coding, they're gonna understand how to communicate with the coder so that way they can understand what they're saying so that way they can pass it on to the provider if there's a legitimate problem. Because again, a nurse can see that there's something clinically off here or they may not even notice it and the coder can say, hey, wait a second, there's something that's here that's missing. And if they know how to communicate that to that CDI nurse, that CDI nurse can say, oh, yeah, here it is. Let's talk this over with the provider so that they can understand where we're trying to come from. So that's why I say it's very important. <laughs> but yeah, you can. It just takes a little bit more effort <laughs> because CDI is nothing to play with, you know, and it's it is next level. It'll make you think <laughs> for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, but you know, inpatient coding is, is also another beast. I will say that, you know, my hat's off to you, Jackie. <laughs> uh, Alexandra says I downloaded and printed the new guidelines so I can read them on my time. There you go. Samantha, I agree. So I agree on TikTok. I feel like I'm watching people, people's attention spans grow shorter and shorter. That's exactly what I was trying to say. That is so true. And I can't, I cannot. That's why I was like, no, I'm going to leave my videos. As long as I leave my videos, I'm going to keep doing my videos like I've been doing them because I feel like it's like trying to like, I know I'm shouting into the wind sometimes with some of these things. And I really thought that you guys weren't going to take me seriously with this coding guidelines challenge. And then when I seen so many people, they're like, yes, Blue, I want to do this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm actually getting through to people. So I know it's actually working. So I'm going to continue to be myself when it comes to this. But yes, absolutely. The attention span is just getting shorter and shorter. Don't let it happen, people. Don't let it happen. Just, just keep doing things the old fashioned way with books and reading and studying and listening. Keep your attention spans long so that way you can have more information and you can make more informed decisions. It's not just, oh, well, I only heard this little sound bite and now I made up my mind. No, it's not about that. It's about getting all the information that you can. Absolutely. 
Um, Smith says, I appreciate the long videos. <laughs> You're very detailed. Yay! <laughs> uh, B says, exactly what I'm doing. I'm typing short statements. Um, Alexandra says, taking notes while reading is how I have always learned more complicated concepts. That's right. Jackie says, exactly, Blue. Coders would be great for CDI because nurses do not understand coding like we do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, B agrees with Alexandria. Uh, court says, CDI gold standard course is which course? The one from um, HC Pro. You type in HC, um, H like in Henry, C like in Cat, Pro, P R O. And you'll see uh, the website come up and they have a bunch of different boot camps. Now, here's the thing. These boot camps are expensive and they're only 60 days access and that's it. So if you are going to go for a boot camp, you better be feed in because they will, it will go. That time will just be flying by. And I went through two of those boot camps. I went through the inpatient coding boot camp, which was good because I already had inpatient coding um knowledge but i didn't have like the full thing so that kind of filled in some of those gaps that was good but that cdi course oh yes and the 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 course is modeled after actus so that's the course that you want but again you only get 60 days and they mean it 60 days that's all you get <laughs> um uh alexis says okay a once a month payment without having to join another self-paced program. I'm all, <laughs> I'm in, I'm all in on blue on Patreon. Yay. <laughs> uh, Alexandria. Great. Alexis. I'm on blue Patreon too. She gives us so many great homework assignments. Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> um, because I try to like, keep it, uh, I try to keep it different. Like I try to make sure that I cover everything like CPT coding, um, ICD 10 CM coding and, um, ICD-10 PCS coding. And so when I do the once a month uh, lives on Zoom, it's a really good time, like if you had any questions. Uh, although I did catch myself, I flubbed up on one. There's one I was like, I don't know what the heck I was doing because I was reviewing it again and I said, oh no, <laughs> I'm gonna have to explain myself, Lucy, <laughs> because it was really bad. But I was like, you know what? I, this is what happens when you write stuff out and then you come back and look at it later. You're just like, what was I thinking? You know, so. It was an EGD one, so <laughs> it should have been an esophagoscopy. Esophagoscopy? I get confused on how to say it, but whatever. <laughs> but that's what it should have been. I was like, oh! But anyway, I'm human. It happens, you know? What are we gonna do? So, but yeah. But that's what I tried to do on uh, Patreon. And Patreon, all just so you guys know, transparency here, uh, all the funds that I raise on Patreon go to my education. And so, I am not a believer in student loans. I have never believed in student loans for anything. And so I've always said that if you're going to continue your education, either have your employer pay for it or you pay for it out of pocket. Yes, I know we're having this whole thing with the student loan things and stuff like that, but I have seen too many things about what student loans do to people. And no, I have always been resistant to student loans and I will always be resistant to student loans as much as I can. So that's why I say, what I make on Patreon it goes right into my education and for paying for books or whatever. And so that's that's really important too. This year I did not go to conference, which I would have normally gone to conference, uh, but I didn't go this year, um, but I will go next year. <laughs> it's gonna be in Baltimore next year. So if you are interested in going to the AHIMA annual national conference, um, it will be in Baltimore next year in October. So be looking forward to that. This will be my second time going to Baltimore. Um, my schedule has been crazy <laughs> as of late, so that's why I didn't go this year. And um, it's a really good way to network if you are interested in going to these conferences and why do you go? You go because you can earn a lot of continuing education units and especially if you need to earn more of them, you can earn them all in one sitting. It is a great place to meet amazing nerds <laughs> because we're all really nerds at the end of the day <laughs> and when you go there you know you meet all kinds of wonderful people i have met three wonderful ladies since i've been going to conference and um we meet up for conference every year um but of course we didn't meet up this year we haven't met up in the last few years because of the pandemic and stuff 
Um, but you know, next year I will be seeing one of the ladies, Leah. And so I'll be very excited for that. <laughs> so yes, I agree. I don't like TikTok for learning either. Um, Medina says, I mean, either student loans are a scam. They are, they are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, Alexandria says, I'm glad you aren't trying to teach on TikTok. Thanks for your long videos. That's good. I'm so glad because like I said, TikTok is just like, it's just so fast. And while yes, the videos can be entertaining, that it's just meant for entertainment. It's not meant for like learning something, you know what I'm saying? And that's that I just never, I was never comfortable with that idea. And like I said, I've just been so resistant to cer certain things, you know what I mean? And that was one of the things that I just like absolutely put my foot down on. And even like when the pandemic started and everybody's like, oh my gosh, everybody's on TikTok. And, you know, you can really expose your, you know, channel to a lot of people and grow. You know, the channel's growing. I mean, I'm, I'm hitting a growth spurt again. <laughs> and we're at 21,000. We're creeping up to 22,000 here pretty soon. So I'm excited about that. I'm thankful to you guys for uh, all of your support and, you know, following the channel and watching the videos. And I'm glad that my tough love can reach some people it, it, sometimes it doesn't you know but i think to the people that it does i think it's more of those people and i think it's helped a lot more people than it's annoyed some you know <laughs> but uh for those people that it has helped you know it it means a lot it means a lot when i get those emails from people and they say that you know they're able to have this new career and you know they listened to my advice and they were able to get their first job i love those and like I've, I've cried on some of those um, emails that I get. I won't read them <laughs> on, on air because, you know, it's just, it like it chokes me up when I see those because that's a, that's a difference in somebody's life. It literally is. And when you have that, when people tell you that you did that, you know, that, that, that means a lot because this isn't just like a one-time thing. This is like for your career. People have 20 and 30 year careers out of this, you know? And so that's that's a lot and it means a lot to me and when i get those those affirming words you know from people it's really nice you know because i would hope that somebody would have done this for me you know there wasn't this when i was coming up you know uh at least that i knew of <laughs> there wasn't this there wasn't somebody like me who was like okay this is these are the facts you know <laughs> and you know this is this is the the story straight you know so I don't know. Um, Smith says, yes, you have helped me. It was rough. And see, because a lot of times when people are getting into medical coding, they're kind of going through it on their own because they got a lot of people around them telling them, don't do it. Um, I've heard from people who said um, that even people I went to school with, they're like their own family members would tell them, you're not smart enough to do this. I'm like, how can you say that to an adult? You know what I'm saying? Or you'll never do this. It's too hard to get a job. It's going away and blah, blah, blah. All this ignorant stuff that they have no idea what they're talking about. And so when I come on here and I'm I'm saying, you know, all these things because this is this is what I know. And this is this is what I'm gonna tell you guys. Because I'm like I said, I'm not selling you a program, you know, and I'm not trying to like push anything on you. And I'm telling you that you can do this because this is what happened to me. This was my experience. You know, I went through the WIOA program. Back then it was WIA. <laughs> but I didn't have to pay to go to school. I went through a program through the state and they paid for me to go to school. And all the only thing I had to do was get a job in the field that I was trained. And here, 13, 14 years later, I'm still in it. And so this is my way of paying it forward, paying it back. You know, and this is also my way of continuing my mother's legacy because my mother was the one who pushed me and helped me through school when the times when I fell and was just like, oh my gosh, this all this stuff, you know, <laughs> I love school, but come on, you know, and my mom was right there pushing me, you know, she was right there making those crossword puzzles for me, which is why I do them for my Patreons, you know, because that's how I learned uh, medical terminology and that's how I sharpened my medical terminology and anatomy knowledge because she did that for me, you know, and so it was, it's, it means a lot to me that I had such a great support with her. So, you know, when she passed away and she passed away, uh, about a little over a year after I got my certification and I was just happy that she could see me 
in this new career and that she knew I was going to be okay because I had this. And I remember all of her like encouragement and everything and what it meant to me being an adult. So I can just imagine that there's people out there who di don't have a mom like mine, um, who don't have a support system like I did, and they're struggling. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to do this and I'm going to help people and I'm going to let them know that yes, they can because absolutely you can. And that's why I'm doing this. And that's why I will continue to do this and I won't change <laughs> who I am and how I am and you know, there's a lot of people who always sometimes get those emails, you know, you need to change this, you need to change that. Never, not change it for anybody. I'll improve, but I'll never change for anybody. And so, you know, this is this is my way of continuing her legacy and, you know, doing those things and, you know, sharing the field that I love and the fact that I haven't felt like I have had to work <laughs> since 2014 when I discovered I had that aha moment where it wasn't just a job anymore. It was a career. And I understood what that meant. So that's where it's like, okay, <laughs> we can do this. And then in 2018 was when I started the channel. And that was just like, okay, here we go. You know, and so now it's just a part of what I do. <laughs> it is a part of what I do. Smith says, yes, ma'am. Me and my husband are both CPCAs and we have heard it all. Uh, Medina says, Blue, you are blessed to be a blessing. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Smith says, she is very proud of you and she's right there with you. You are truly a blessing. I appreciate that. Um, Sarah says, I'm here for your tough love. It's very motivating. I have been in the coding field for eight years now and I need a guidelines refresher. Yay! <laughs> um, Tania says, you are right. You and my hubby are my only support system. Oh, there you go. That is awesome. I like when I hear that um, spouses are people's support system as well. Because, you know, that's not always the case, you know. And so when, when I see that, that's really awesome. That is really awesome. And I like that. I like to see that. Because it's hard enough on us to learn this stuff. But to have people around that are like, hey, you can do this. You can do this. That's really good instead of the opposite. You know, which sometimes does happen, unfortunately, to some. Um, but, like I said, it's fun. And, you know, the guidelines challenge is a guidelines challenge. I'm glad that people have gotten into it. I am so glad to hear that because, again, we got to keep those attention spans long. <laughs> and um, building that knowledge is, is not an overnight thing. It takes time. And so if it's taking you time to read those guidelines, it's okay. Not everybody's a fast reader. But you're going to be a faster reader by the end of the month had you gone through the whole guidelines. You know, even going through the guidelines once and then going through it again. And then pushing yourself to keep going through it. Because like I said, the more you go through it, the more it's going to become familiar. You don't have to memorize it, but you'll see it. And then when you do, oh, okay, it'll, it'll be like your brain's going to recall, hey, no, I saw something in the guidelines. And you're going to be able to flip right to the guidelines and know that it's in there. I'm just saying. All right, guys. <laughs> so we have already been on here uh, almost two hours. So I'm, I'm going to try to close this before two hours because I do hear it. Blah, your show went two hours. Well, I mean, there's other YouTubers that they go a long time too. Um, one of the other YouTubers I like to watch, uh, he has a channel called Think Like a Horse, Rick. <laughs> he used to be a, um, a police officer and uh, he was in the military and things like that. He, he talks a lot of common sense stuff. He's like me, but a man, you know. And <laughs> but he's just like really like you guys think that I'm blind. Oh, I, I trust me. I am like Minnie Mouse when it comes to this guy, Rick. But he has like really long shows like you see him like his shows and he's like guys i'm not supposed to go this long <laughs> so i'm just saying at least i'm not that bad because his shows go on for like three or four hours you know sometimes i'll listen to him like during the day i'll i'll have i'll turn him on and i'll just be working and i'll sit, be sitting there cracking up because some of the stuff that he comes out with i'm like man <laughs> and i know my shows get like that too especially when it goes long like this but you know, <laughs> um, 
Smith says, so I probably shouldn't read out of my 2021, just download the 2023. Yes, download the 2023 because those are the most latest and greatest updated guidelines. You know, those 2021s are not going to help you, um, especially if you need to know the stuff now. <laughs> Um, Alexandria says, I wish I hadn't jumped on the student loan bandwagon years ago, but it did help at the time with my family um, and me in school and working. But it stinks now paying them back. Well, yeah. But yes, Smith, um, download the ICD 10 CM coding guidelines from the CMS website. Definitely, because of the latest and greatest. <laughs> uh, Alexandria says, Yes, we are all nerds. <laughs> Yes, we are. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the downloaded, mm -hmm, the downloaded new guidelines. Yes. Um, there have been updates. So just make sure that you're reading the 2023, you know, because that's, that's what you want to be most up to date on is the latest guidelines. Okay. That's just what I'm saying. Unless you're taking your test with AHIMA and you're taking it before, uh, April of, because um, you have till the end of April 2023 to use your 2022 books. So if that's the case, then yes, you can read from the 2022 book uh, because your your test is going to be based on the 2022 guidelines. OK, so did y'all did y'all catch that? If you are taking your test with a HEMA before uh, before May, so like by the end of April of 2023, your test is going to be covering the 2022 guidelines. So yes, you want to read the 2022 guidelines, but if you plan to take the test after May, because once May 1st hits, that's when they upload the new uh, test based on the 2023 guidelines. That's when you want to make sure that you're reading the appropriate guidelines. Okay, so I'm just saying. <laughs> um, Smith says, oh, that's good. I'm going to download the 23 and buy the 23 soon. Yay! Time flies when you're having fun. Yes, Sarah, <laughs> it does. Uh, Medina says, yes, I am taking the exam in June, so the 2023 manuals. Yes, perfect. Um, Alexandria says, I haven't purchased the 2023 books yet because I want to look at Optum this time instead of AAPC. And they have their sale. Optum has their sale. They're 80% off for, I think, the 2022 books. They're 80% off right now. And the 2023 books are on sale. So I'm just saying. Uh, you're welcome, Tracy. Thank you for all the blue hearts. But yes, so guys, um, Optum always has great sales. And I have such a hard time with Optum because when you go there, you want to look at all the books and you start ordering. And it's really hard because you, <laughs> you want to order all these books and they're just so cheap. And you're like, yay. Um, Alexandra says, you're amazing, Blue, just being you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, she says, I think it's time to check out Optum Books. Optum Books are amazing. Like I said, the 20, uh, the ICD 10 CM book has all those examples on the diagnosis before every chapter. I don't know of any other book that does that. I don't know of no other publisher that does it. And then in the PCS book, it has all those procedures in the back that you can practice on, and that's going to give you a great workout in that PCS book. And that is really awesome because at the end of the day, you want to be clear on your approaches, on the body systems, and that's really going to show you the whole book. <laughs> there is no greater practice than that. Trust me. Um, Sarah says the same problem here with books. Yes. <laughs> Their customer service is awesome too. Yes, and they're very prompt. I'm just saying. And it's free shipping. You can't beat that. I'm just saying. So, all right, guys. <clears throat> My throat is drying out because of all the talking. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. But again, if you are on my Patreon channel um, at the $10 and above, tomorrow is the uh, study hall at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. You know, uh, one if you're on the Pacific Coast, four if you're on the East Coast. And it's going to be a good time. And I will see y'all again on Monday. And stick with that challenge, guys. I am almost done on my third round. I'm almost done with the third round. i got a few more pages to go. <laughs> so we'll see how I do. Because I may be only be able to pull off three times this month. I don't know. I'm going to try to see if I can get to four. But I may be only able to do <laughs> You're welcome, Samantha. Thank you, Smith. Thank you, Medina. All right, guys. 
So I'm going to wrap this one up. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Please like, subscribe, and share, and I will see y'all again. Have a great weekend. Bye.